always manage to spread out in a longer line. Don't like you having such a wide berth. <laughs> um, We're going to go on with um, the, uh, the the five offerings. Now, you remember in the tabernacle, as we said on Tuesday, um, in the tabernacle there were to be offered five offerings. No point in having a tabernacle unless you have a purpose for it, and God's purpose was that there might be offerings made. And four of the offerings were with blood, and one was without blood. You all remember that. Hmm? Right, which was the bloodless one? The meat offering. It's very good. And now we're going on to deal with a burnt offering. Now, the burnt offering is a very specific offering in one regard that nothing comes back to the offerer. It's all burnt. In other words, it's a total giveaway. You remember with the um, meat offering, what happened? You don't remember. Hmm? The priests had it. They, all the frankincense was burned, as you remember. And uh, the priests had a fine flour mixed with what? Hmm? Oil. Yeah. And honey? No, that's right. Weren't allowed. God forbade honey, which speaks of natural sweetness. Uh, that's one thing God doesn't accept in any sacrifice. Uh, the natural human attributes. Many people a mistake for holiness, a personality that's developed in culture or is ever such a gracious person. That's natural sweetness and God has forbidden it in his kingdom. That's why you don't find many people like that get very far with God, though they'll get very far in the world's church. And there's a lot of them around. Okay, so we go on to the burnt offering, and if you turn with me to the good book and Leviticus chapter 1, it's the third book of Moses, so they tell us. And in verse 1, the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntarily, voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation of the Lord. Now, what is so similar to the meat offering? Hmm? Voluntary. This was not a compulsory thing. He had to voluntarily do it. Uh, it's nothing to do with sin in this sense it's not a sin or a trespass offering nor is it a peace offering it's a burnt offering and you remember that these four things depict um, the four, four ones with blood depict the act upon the cross and this one portrays uh, the side of the Lord offering himself willingly upon the cross and it's important that we see that he did it of his own will. He volunteered to do it and did it. In eternal heavens, when God said what was going to happen and God talked with God, Father said to Son, You know, Son, you'll create them, but there's going to be sin. And Son said, I know, Father. 
And father said, well, what should we do? And son said, well, father, I'll become man and lay down my life that I might win them by my love. And father said, that's fine, son. And so it was so. It was worked out before the creation of the world in God's heart. And Jesus, the word, became flesh. And I want to trace it through, this glorious truth of the burnt offering. Now, Jesus never ever gave his life because he sinned. He was the sinless one, the holy one. There was no reason for him to lay down his life. He voluntarily did it, didn't he? He did it of his own free will. And yet, within the pages of the good book, we learn something about the nature of his will. And it is this sacrifice above all else that really shows forth the love of Christ. And um, if you go on from verse... Uh, Three, notice verse 3 it did say that it had to be a male without blemish and there was only one male ever that lived without blemish the Christ of God he was the only one who walked a holy pure sinless life thank God for that and um, verse 4 and he shall put his hand upon the um upon the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him all right let's go on to um, um, we'll read on yeah and verse 5 and he shall kill the bullock before the Lord and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire and the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar but his inward and his legs shall he wash in water and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice an offering made by fire of a sweet savour unto the Lord I, w I just want to stop there because we want to go through and pick out exactly what everything means now um, we're going to do a Bible study, so we're going to turn the pages of the book and we're going to look. Because everything really is explained if one goes through Scripture. And one needs to go through Scripture and not get anyone else's ideas. Don't you agree? Because in the end, it's only the good book that will tell us. And you remember that, first of all, the offering had to be without blemish. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9 Hebrews chapter 9 Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. That word spot there in the Greek, as you all know, means without fault or without blemish. Jesus Christ offered himself and he was the one without blemish. The only one that's ever been without blemish. He offered himself unto God. And he offered himself totally voluntarily. Now I want to explain something that um, you'll look up for a minute. Uh, we'll go back looking down in a second. There is something very important to understand that only 
God is good. Do you remember Nicodemus came to Jesus by night? He was a man who came and he said, good master, and he says, there's none good, said Jesus, save God. Hmm? And he says, we know no, no man can do these miracles except he come from God. And Jesus didn't take the compliment because he didn't like honey. Uh, he knew that was a sacrifice that had to be refused by God. You know, God never likes being complimented in that way. Uh, he is because of his majesty, his might, and his glory. All things. And he's so wonderful. But he doesn't like us to come and to try and uh, win things out of him by telling him how wonderful he is in the wrong way. You know, he doesn't like flattery. He likes truth from the inward part. Many men flatter God. They seek to say such wonderful things. They think God will think they're wonderful back. But it must come from an inward reality. If I don't know it deep within my soul, it's the same as singing. Uh, when I sing something unto God in a meeting, then I must sing it from my inward part. Now tonight, when a lot of you came in, you didn't sing from your inward part. You sang, but you didn't sing from your inward parts. Now, God totally disregarded it. That's that. He wasn't having anything to do with it, so we sat down. And that's that. Now, that's why a meeting will lift sometimes, and God moves, and it won't lift at other times, because people aren't singing from their inward parts. You didn't. Lots of you didn't. I could look around the room and say, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't. You didn't. It's quite simple. When you're in touch with the Lord, you know who's moving in reality and who isn't. Now you see, the truth must come from the inside. That's why when Nicodemus came and said, Good Master, we know. Jesus looked at him and said, There's none good save God. What he was actually saying to Nicodemus is, Don't you really know who I am? Nicodemus had a suspicion but wasn't prepared to confess it. He was a Pharisee. But, um, praise God, is meant mentioned later on in the Scriptures. And I believe that God, in the end, brought him to a real experience. But the thing was that he came and said, Good Master, now there's no one good save God. There is no one who's righteous or has righteousness but Christ and God. There's only one person who could live a righteous and holy life. That was God. Now God wanted to atone for man and restore man into communion with him. Now there was no way that man could atone for man. Because man was conceived and born in sin. Sin had entered the human race and by it genetically sin is passed down. You might be one of these people that believe that everyone is born um, holy. They're not. They're born with a seed of Satan and the seed of sin within themselves. It is within their nature. It is intrinsic within their being. There is no man who's born under the sun save the one and only Jesus Christ who was ever born without sin. He was born of the Holy Ghost, conceived of the Virgin Mary, and there was no male seed passed into him. The seed was God's seed and Mary's seed. You see, because Adam sinned, Eve didn't. Eve was deceived. Adam made the willful choice. This is why God makes a great distinction between man and woman when it comes to dealing in the church, a wife must submit to her husband in all things. Why? Because a woman is susceptible to deception in the spirituals. Very open to deception. That's the way she's made. You'll notice that a woman will usually move by intuition. A man will move in his plodding way by logic. A woman will enter far easier into the things of God but my, won't you step far quicker out of them. Move out of that ordering God and you're on a death trap. Believe me, that's why when I go to many, many churches where I see the women wear the trousers, I shudder. 
because that's bound to end in deception bound to because God has said so that's why he said suffer a woman not to teach nor to usurp authority all right now that seed of woman though uh, Eve didn't sin Adam sinned you see God had spoken to Adam you remember the story hmm God said to Adam now Eve now Eve heard what God had said to Adam but she wasn't spoken to direct and therefore when Paul recounts it he says Eve was deceived Adam sinned he made a decision and sinned you understand that now when Christ was conceived he was conceived of this seed of woman but it was God's seed who joined with the seed of woman and therefore that holy thing that was born was a sinless son son of God and son of man you understand the two had to come together and that is why it's vital and we must understand that the virgin birth if it wasn't a virgin birth then forget it pastor there is no salvation because Christ couldn't have been sinless you understand that that is why uh, you'll get in the attacks of the um, uh, whatever they are called I can't think of the name it's gone from my mind um, um, the idiots who call themselves theologians in the present day modernists will always attack the, the virgin birth and they'll you know you find people when they want to attack oh you know I don't believe in the virgin birth but that is absolutely primarily essential to faith in God if you don't believe in the virgin birth you cannot be a Christian impossible because you can't believe in if you don't believe in the virgin birth you can't believe in the holy son of God and that's fact because you see it had been born in sin and conceived in sin wouldn't he hmm it's the same way that lots of people come to me. I had a vicar. He, I came and saw me, and um, I was talking with him, and he said, "Well, he, he said, of course, the Old Testament's mythology, you know, it's good Anglican. So the Old Testament's mythology, like, uh, well, like any story, it's just illustrations." And I said, "Sir, might I stop you there and ask you one question?" I said, "All right." So I said, "Well, if..." sin came in by more than one man it would have taken more than one man to atone for it if it wasn't just Adam that sinned if there had been many many then there would have had to be many many sacrifices but because Adam sinned and sin came in by one man therefore in the righteousness of God and in his righteous judgment one man could atone for that now God in his wisdom allowed Satan to get at the one man he knew about procreation God knew that there was going to be multitudes of nations upon the earth but he made sure that the serpent moved against Adam and Eve while there was only one that was the wisdom of God now the serpent in his mind thought if I can get the original one if I can get the one before there's a multitude upon the earth then he thought I'll have the whole earth under my power such was Satan's reasoning now God knew Satan's pride so he knew that that would be his thought get the top man the others will just be born that way and Satan thought he could usurp God's authority on the earth but what Satan didn't bargain with was that when he caused man to rebel against God what was born and conceived in the heart of Adam was rebellion so every single person that was born after that had a rebel heart now not only would they rebel against God but they rebelled against Satan also I mean that was in their nature 
they couldn't yield to God and they weren't going to yield to the devil either. So then he had to work out schemes of how he'd get them to worship him. But you see, God had seen all this beforehand. Praise his wonderful name. He knows all things from the beginning to the end. So he organized it that way. Left Adam in the garden. I mean, God didn't go to sleep when the serpent came to tempt Adam. He wasn't asleep. That was in his plan. He knew it would happen. But he knew it had to happen with the one man before the others came. Isn't that wonderful? He cared that much for us. He made sure it happened with the one. And he allowed it to happen. I mean, he could have smote the devil dead then and there. He had the power, didn't he? Could have finished the thing like that, but no, he let it go on. That's the, the miracle of it all. That's why I think it's so wonderful when I start to, to go into the story of salvation and of God, to think that God knew and in his grace and his love he made jolly sure that Adam sinned before there was any other seed upon the earth. Now he allowed the seed to become contaminated when it was just one seed. In Adam all die. In Christ all are made alive. You see, one man and that was why it was so essential. Now, of course, if you don't believe in Adam and Eve, you can't be a Christian. Can you? And that's that. I mean, it's just impossible to be a Christian if you don't believe in Adam and Eve. Because a Christ man or a Christian believes in atonement for sin. And if it didn't come by one man, that's Paul's argument when he writes the letter to the Romans. Chapter 5 and 6, you remember? Or chapter 4 and 5, I beg your pardon, where he talks about it. Sin came in by one. In Adam all sin. Hmm? You understand that? In the same way, don't forget, he argues, or, or the writer to the Hebrews argues, should I say, that... Uh, uh, Levi paid tithes while he was in the bowels of Abraham. Do you remember that? When Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And he argued that Levi paid tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek, even though he was not yet born. Do you remember that story? Now, he might have been a generation further down, but he was still counted to have paid tithes, even though he hadn't been born. So a lot of things that you find... God gives you credit for in your life could be two generations back and a lot of sin that has to be dealt with in you was conceived two or three generations back and sometimes more to the third and fourth generation the judgment of God and these things work in the spirituals and that is the way it is and I want to go on, our original father, therefore sin, and Jesus, the only holy one. And it had to be a holy one. As Adam sinned, Adam was created holy. Adam was created innocent. Now when I say innocent, it meant that he was without temptation at that point. He was in innocence. He did not know the difference between good and evil. The only command he had from God was you can do what you like, you can eat anywhere, tend the garden, but don't touch the tree in the middle of the garden. And what tree was that? Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now don't touch that tree. Take of the tree of life if you want to, but not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now Adam wanted freedom of choice. So he took of that tree so he could decide what was right and what was wrong. And that is man's fault today. I tell you this, that many, many people, if you want to analyze where they go wrong with God, it's they want to decide what they'll accept and what they won't accept. 
I find many people, when you turn them to the scriptural page and the good book, they won't accept what the good book says. They'll accept it up to the point that it suits them, but when it touches self in them, then they don't like it. I remember I was asked to see a, a woman who um, was violent disagreement with her husband, and I touched on the scripture, wives, submit yourselves. Well, I don't believe in that. She was a women's, whatever they are, Liberace or something. And she, she didn't believe in it, you see. So I said, now look, the book says in all things, it doesn't give conditions, that's what it says. Ah, oh, well, if he changes then... No, I said, dear, says that. says, well, I don't accept it. I said, well, that's what the book says. So she went away, and she's still in darkness, because she's determined not to accept it. Now, you have to accept what God says, you see. We haven't a choice of deciding the nature of good and evil. We can't say this is good and that's bad. That is the sin of Adam. He wanted to decide what he wanted as good and what he wanted as evil. Do you understand? Now, God forbade that, and yet we as Christians, so often we like to draw a line and decide what we'll accept of God and what we won't. Now, if that's your touchstone, or if that's the thing you move on, you're yet in your darkness. You haven't ever had your rebel heart dealt with. You see, there is unequivocally no appeal against God's word. God's word is ultimate, God's word is final, and God's word is eternal, and God's word's going to judge you in the day of judgment. It'll be God's word. You'll go up there and say, Well, my husband wasn't kind to me, it is written. Say, so, Well, I didn't accept that, it's written. And the Word will judge you. It says the Word's going to judge you. You know, you can read the Word and you can obey it, or you can read the Word and you can choose to go your own way. Hmm? Got your choice? Said to another man, he came to see me, um, had a ministry, church, so-called, and he was living off, off what, what he didn't get, in fact, he was not living, he was dying by faith. And I pointed out to him there were principles that he was violating in Scripture. Well, I'll give you another example. Three pastors came to me, and, and they were living on fizz. Now, fizz, in case you don't know, is family income supplement. They were living by faith, running churches, collecting fizz. Now, the reason they were collecting fizz is because the church couldn't pay them a high enough income because they were building new buildings. So they were going down and collecting off Social Security fees. So I said to the three of them, God will not bless your ministry. Well, why won't God? Because God's not supporting you. Oh, yes, he is. No, he isn't, because God doesn't pay for you through Social Security. He happens to have a glorious bank in heaven and when he wants to call people out to his service he doesn't use fizz to do it with. Oh, well, two-thirds of the AOG ministers draw it, so why shouldn't we? Well, it happens to violate God's word. God says that a labourer is worthy of his hire. Hire? Oh, well, well, we believe it. Anyway, you're allowed to do it. In the law of the country, I said, because the law allows for layabouts, it doesn't mean you can become one. I mean, the law now allows divorce. No Christian minister would recommend it, would they? Except in certain circumstances, where the scripture recommends it. No one would do that. And the law allows homosexuality, but no Christian would even have any truck with it, would they? So I said, nor can you draw fizz. Hmm. Well, two of them went away and won't speak to me since and say wonderful things about me. Um, they were one of an army, so praise God. 
But one took it to heart and he went back to his church and he said, right, he said, I will not draw family income supplement. That's it. If my wife and I starve, we starve. Now, what a heart. But I was called by God. I believe I have a real calling from God. And therefore, God's going to keep me. And so he cancelled it. And for three months, he nearly starved. Fourth month, the income of his church went up 40%. Just like that. No reason. From then on, his church began to grow. And people began to be added. You know why? God decided that he was now trusting in God instead of in social security so God thought it was safe to bless the man a little. That's the way God operates. Now you see, it was according to the book. Now two chose not to go according to the book and their churches are getting smaller. In fact, one had to leave his church and has gone to another church which he'll no doubt decimate as well. But the other pastor, his church is collapsing round him because he's violating biblical principle. Now, when you come to the Bible, there is no right of appeal. You cannot say, well, it's not what I want to accept. It's there, it's written, and it is eternal. And there is no variation. God in whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. And God will not change his mind for you. He hasn't put a special clause in saying, excluding David Green, who has a nice smile, so I won't make him do that. I mean, you've had it. You've got to do everything. And he won't say excluding Colin Clemenson, because he can kick a bag of wind. I mean, he, he's not, he'll go and everyone it applies to. You see? And that's why the sword is a two-edged sword, because when you preach the word it cuts both ways doesn't it you see I have to preach it from my heart but if it hadn't cut my heart first then it's not going to do much in you if it upsets you I want to tell you something it upset me far harder and far deeper far longer ago than you think you see, there's many of you, but I got the whole lot of me. You see, a two-edged sword. Whoom! But I had to take the lot my way. If you think I'm kidding, I'm not. That's why when people get angry, I laugh. They don't know I got far more angry when I had it under me. <laughs> and therefore, they don't know. Well, I was born and conceived in sin like you. I did have a mother irrespective of rumours and I was born in the same way and, and you know I had a father and, and we're all born that way and our natures are all the same now it's nothing to be ashamed of it's something you confess freely if you really have had God deal with your nature you know your sin nature then you're prepared to open up and admit it a fool buries his head in the sand. I think there's nothing more, you know, stupid. Have you ever been to the zoo and looked at ostriches with their head buried? I mean, they look totally and utterly ridiculous. With their backside stuck up in the air, two spindly legs and this neck with a, just disappearing into the ground. Now, they believe that they are safe and no one can see them. Well, that's why they do it for protection now I, I mean you don't have to be a great great man of discernment to know that you could go up to that ostrich and give it one hefty boot in the back side and it would wake up realizing that someone could see him when it had their head stuck in the ground um, although an ostrich might boot you back and believe me they have quite a kick I'm told um, the thing is that Christians are a bit like that. They try and pretend that their heart isn't what it is. But the ridiculous thing is, it's so obvious to everyone else, the only person they deceive is themselves. Hypocrites only deceive themselves. Jesus sat there, 
you remember the story of Jesus sitting by the treasury watching what people how people put money in he wasn't watching the amount he was watching how they did it and there was the widow's mite you remember the story and he watched the Pharisees throwing in out of their abundance you see it was how they did it and he was watching and Jesus watches us you see now he knows what's going on inside and it's written all over your face and it's on your forehead and it's round you and it's in your disposition of body and spirit it's obvious when we move into praise you can see light and darkness you can see where it is if you stand near people you can feel the deadness of spirits you can feel a dead spirit I'm not suggesting you go around testing it um, but you can you just know if you know and them that knows knows um, that's why he's given us again you see we should witness in our spirits one to another and you know whether a spirit's alive or dead simple don't need a great gift of discernment you know saying oh and you discern you need to discern spirits you just need to discern whether a man has life or death that's all you know, people think it's this discerning of devils. They're always trying to chase devils up the chimney. Silly people. I mean, they're not the trouble. The trouble's sin in people's lives. Can't blame the devil. People incriminate the devil. Accuse him of all sorts of things. And when they get to glory, God will say, now these are the works of the flesh. Fornication, adultery lasciviousness all the things that they say oh it's a spirit of lust or it's a spirit of this or a spirit of God will say no it's not it's a sin of the flesh it's written say well I didn't believe it no you might not but it's down in the book and that's what will judge you and so God had to come in Christ God and he was the only one that could live a holy and pure life incarnate God Jesus said there's none good save God what he was saying to Nicodemus is Nicodemus I'm God Nicodemus didn't want to hear that and wouldn't accept it he came down and he came in visible form to earth as the son of God if you turn with me to Psalm 40 can someone open the door back there so we can get some air anything to get a little air in even I'm hot so it must be hot and Psalm 40 Jesus came in the visible form of God but in Psalm 40 we read um, in uh, let's take verse 7 then said I um, oh, um, let's take verse 6 sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire mine ears hast thou opened burnt offerings and sin offering hast thou not required then said I lo I come in the volume of the book it is written of me I delight to do thy will O my God yea thy law is within my heart and if you have a Cambridge Bible it will have in the margin in the midst of my bowels I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continuous, continually preserve me. 
Um, it's talking of Christ here and it's prophetic. And he says, verse 7, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it's written of me, I delight to do thy will, O God. Now Jesus' delight was to do God's will. It was voluntary. That was his delight, to do God's will. The second thing was, Yea, thy law is within my heart. Now there were two things about Christ when he came in visible form. First he came with the sole intention of doing God's will and that was the only delight he got in life. That was the delight to do God's will and Father's will. The second thing was his law, that God's law, was in his heart. There was no way that Christ was going to deviate from God's law. It was in him. And he was going to fulfill it. Come what may, he was going to be God on earth walking among men. That was his determination. And if you turn with me then to John 10. And John 10, and we take verse 15. And it says these words, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, one shepherd. Therefore doth the Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me but I lay it down of myself Jesus Christ laid down his life of himself when Pilate turned around and said don't you know I've got power to let you go and I've got power to kill you Jesus said you can't have any power except it's given you from above you can't do it when Mary went to call Jesus and said uh, you know they have no wine. Jesus turned around and said, Woman, my hour's not yet come. Speaking prophetically of his death, which was three, three years hence. But he was so in touch with Father, he knew what Father's will was, and he knew his hour hadn't come. You understand? When the disciples got fearful and said, Look, let, oh, you know, one of them, who was it? Um, Thomas said oh come on let's go up to Jerusalem and die with him and uh, I mean he got faith but Jesus knew exactly where he was going and what was going to happen he went through with God he knew and we have to come to a place of realizing that when Christ came and when the burnt offering which is depicted of Christ was laid upon the altar it was a perfect fulfillment of Father's will now it's noticeable if you just look back into Leviticus we're going to go through it to show how it symbolized the cross but in Leviticus 1 you might have noticed something that was um, or you might not have noticed Uh, verse 6 and he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces Leviticus 1 and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire now firstly the wood had to be in order and the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts the head the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar and you'll notice that it keeps coming up in order in order now there was a definite order and why was there a definite order why is it put there by the Holy Ghost I mean did that mean they mustn't put it there hickledy pickledy no God wanted it laid there in order you remember when Abraham flayed the animals do you remember in the furnace smoking furnace passed between them do you remember he was told how to divide the animals God had an order 
and God has an order. And if you go on uh, looking in the, into Christ's life your life, you'll see everything was laid out in order. Everything. Every detail in his life had a prophetic order. It was prophesied before time and he fulfilled the law and the prophets. It was all done in the perfect order, both of the sacrifice being laid on the wood, the wood being laid in the order, and the prophetic utterance is all coming to pass through his life in order. And we're just going to examine them. Christ was laid in order upon Calvary. Everything was done in perfect order. And we're going to go through them, and if you've got a pen, mark it down. If you'd start in Psalm 22, verse, verse 18. Psalm 22. Psalm 22 we've got verse 18 and it says these words they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture did they or didn't they yes they did go back to verse 8 he trusteth on the Lord that he would deliver him let him delivering deliver him seeing he delighteth in him all right, did that happen or didn't it? Go back to... They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Did they or didn't they? They did. Christ cried I first on the cross. Uh, Psalm 22, back in Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? You remember Christ upon the cross cried out, My God, my God, when darkness covered the face of the earth and Father hid his face from Son while his Son became sin, who knew no sin. And the judgment of God, the full judgment of God the Father, was poured out upon Jesus as sin sin and the nature of sin your sin my sin not sins but sin nature that wicked evil nature which we get by our first birth that Christ took into himself and died and we, he made that cry upon the cross in perfect order Psalm 34 verse 20 Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. You remember Christ upon the cross when they came to break his knees and break the bones of his legs? They discovered that he was already dead. And he was merely pierced through the side by a centurion. Uh, Psalm, let's go back to Psalm 69. take verse 18 um, draw nigh unto my soul redeem it deliver me because of mine enemies thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor my adversaries are all before me reproach hath broken my heart and I am full of heaviness 
And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. Um, then you go on to the other one about the drink of vinegar. But when Christ came, his heart was broken. And you remember when the centurion thrusted a spear into Christ's side, out came blood and water showing that his heart had broken and Isaiah 53 Isaiah 53 verse 9 and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death now literally translated that means his grave was appointed with the wicked but the wi with the rich man was his tomb that is actually what the Hebrew means um, because he had done no violence neither was there deceit in his mouth and you find in Isaiah 53 9 that is literally it means his grave was appointed with the wicked but with the rich man was his tomb. Now those are all scriptures of Christ's life as the sacrifice set in order. Now if you turn with me now, contrarywise, to the New Testament, we'll find some very interesting things. Matthew 27, Matthew chapter 27, and we'll start at verse 35. And this is a New Testament fulfillment in order of exactly what was prophetically told. And you'll find Matthew 27 verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down they watched him there. They sat down and watched him, but they did exactly, and Christ foretold it would happen, and he allowed himself to go to the cross, and he fulfilled the law and the prophets in that he knew exactly what Calvary meant. When he came to earth, he was under no illusion. He knew exactly what he had to do. He knew the pain he had to go through from the day that he said to father I'll go father and redeem them I'll be the man of redemption when God looked for a man and there was no man to fill the gap Jesus was the one and only Jesus could fulfill that gap and today there's only Christ who can fulfill the gap so if you're one of these intercessors for Britain come down to humbleness only Christ is the true interceder in heaven or you can take a little part playing with your toys but the true interceder is Christ hallelujah he ever liveth to make intercession for us hmm? and there he was coming down to fulfill the word now he knew exactly what it was going to cost and in every detail he permitted it to happen he didn't shirk anything he knew it was Father's will for that, it to be that way because it was written. And because it was written, he was going to walk that way. Now, we know what Father's written. Are we prepared to walk his way? So, well, I don't like it. It causes me too much trouble, exactly. You won't have the cross in your life. You're shirking the cross, man or woman. If you won't go the biblical way, you're dodging life. No cross, no crown. That's the truth. Jesus knew what it meant. It cost. There is a cost in Christianity. A cost. It isn't free. Forgiveness is free. Cleansing's free. Salvation will cost you everything. Say, but it's grace. Exactly. You don't deserve it. You haven't done anything to warrant it. But it'll cost you everything to have it. 
Say, but I thought God gave it all free. Exactly, he does. Totally free. He gave it in his son 2,000 years ago. But to be a partaker of it, it will cost you everything. That's glorious, isn't it? That's why, you see, Calvin could preach one thing, Luther the other, and together you get a glorious balance. Wesley could go up one side of the country and um, Whitfield up the other. They preach totally different things. Go down the middle of the country and you get the balance. straight up the middle hallelujah you see of course God's totally sovereign but of course whomsoever will may come because God's totally sovereign whomsoever will may come but because he foreknew them only those who have chosen before the foundation of the world will ever get there but who knows who they are well God does and that's that that's why it's useful never to be a theologian. You don't get confused then. We'll go on. Matthew 27, verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the elders, the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him, liars. Even if a man proves it, they won't believe. People have come to me and they've said to me, All right, Michael, you say you can do this or, or God will do that. Prove it and we'll believe. If you proved it, they still wouldn't believe. So I never try. Say, so, no, I won't. So there you are, you don't really... I do believe it, but I know that even if we proved it to you, you still wouldn't believe. Those wicked Pharisees, I tell you, if Jesus had stepped off the cross then, he would have been defying Father's will. It was the greatest temptation the devil could throw at Jesus. I remember hearing it preached on one day, years ago now, 14 years ago, I think, 13 years ago. And a minister was preaching on this, and he was preaching a tremendous sermon, and God quickened it to my heart. And it just broke my heart. And God said to me, You know, son, if you'd been there, you'd have got down wouldn't you I said yes father I would <laughs> and he said that son is why I haven't let you be tempted that way yet so thank you father you see he knows just how far you can be tempted he won't let you be tempted above that which you can endure the trouble is we think we can't endure much don't we hmm? <laughs> oh god it's terrible not much son <laughs> you can go a lot further and you know as time goes on God stretches you doesn't he upon his rack of grace and love and he, he expands your faith and you suddenly realize that before you couldn't have taken some now you, you, he's, he's not even a pinprick hmm? before it was a mountain suddenly it's a pinprick but just so you don't get proud, you found a few mountains still coming at you. Well, these are different mountains. Hmm? That's what it means, you see. You go to the mountain top. Oh, glory to God, we're up there. Hallelujah. Victory in Jesus. That's right, son. And, oh, it's wonderful. And then you kind of look round into his wonderful face and he says, son, look there. And you turn round. There's a mountain twice as high. <laughs> and you say, oh, Father. And he says, down in the valley, you've got to get there. And down you go and up the next mountain. You know, that takes a little longer. And finally, stagger to the top and collapse on the top. And he picks you up, dusts you off, 
Hallelujah, glory to God. Fantastic son. And you rejoice in that for a week or two. And then God turns you around and you look, ah, not again. And that goes on in your life. Glorious opportunities to prove the faithfulness of God. But somehow you wish the first mountain was your resting place, don't you? Huh? Oh, you just learn. That's what growing up is. You know, my, my, my when you're young, isn't it wonderful? You know, my, my son's problem this morning was he couldn't find his tuck to take to school. It's a bag of crisps he eats at break. Terrible catastrophe. Daddy couldn't find it either. He put it down somewhere. If his head wasn't screwed on, he'd put it down and forget where he left it. Uh, and I couldn't find it, so in the end he took a Milky Way instead. But, I mean, to a little lad, that's a catastrophe. But if you grow up and you're a man and you lose a bag of crisps, you'd just walk in and buy another one, wouldn't you? I mean, it's all ridiculous. You know, to make it a mountain, it's ridiculous. But to a child, you know, that can be a mountain. And that's how we are, you know, in spiritual terms. Things once that, you look back in your life, the big mountains that you thought you'd never ascend, now you look at them, it's like a bag of crisps. Now you, you wouldn't think twice about them. But you have one or two other little mountains that are real now. Uh, and you begin to realize, you know, you were like Don Quixo. You were charging at windmills. But all of a sudden you find there are real chants in the spiritual. And you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness in high places. And you know what it's about. I know for years in my life, I used to kind of tell people, you know, messing about, fighting demons. Stupid occupation. I mean, no one should waste their time with them. And, and you know, whoa, you bind them in Jesus' name and cast them out. And I thought I was wrestling with principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness in high places. Not little pimps. I mean, they were just pimples. It's like acne, you know, you get that on adolescence, don't you? People get spots all over their face. That's what demons are like, you know, just a little trouble. Clear us all and get rid of it. Um, you know, when you get older, you realize that you were messing. And then there came a day when suddenly it dawned on me. Well, we had to stop messing and get on with God. We had to wrestle against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness in high places. Not mess around with people like that. There was kingdoms and dominions and thrones that needed dealing with. Ruling spirits that come in families and bowing families for generations and then principalities that rule over cities and towns and then thrones that come over churches in deception now those are the things you fight they're nothing to do with demons but you see as a kid it's all right to tilt at windmills that's how you get practice and it kind of encourages your faith doesn't it think what a fantastic thing you've done now my son he plays football at school and he likes to score goals which is a good occupation for a footballer if you're centre forward it's not so good if you're goalkeeper because it'd probably be your own goal but if you're, if you're a centre forward it's a good thing to score goals now to him that's great but there's no way that he's going to be the centre forward of his favourite team which happens to be Arsenal now I mean, he just wouldn't somehow fit into that team. And if he did, I think he would come off rather badly on the first match. Before he'd raised his leg back, I think the ball would have gone and he'd have been flat on his nose. Now, you know, God knows we're, we, we can't cope it within adult things when we're babes in Christ. So what does he do? He deals with us as babes. He doesn't expect us to be above what we are. That's his faithfulness. So be where you are. Be what you are in Christ. Enjoy it. That's good. Enjoy what you've got.
hallelujah for it but no there's more and know that you know in the world you're going to suffer tribulation be of good cheer said Jesus I've overcome the world and won't be long till you're back with me in glory trial of your faith is much more precious than fine gold so know that you're always storing up something precious for Jesus you understand let's go on then um, verse 48 of that Says, oh, um, when he called out Eli, Eli, remember? Um, and then in verse 48, and straight away one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, put it on a reed, and gave him to drink. Remember the story? Fulfillment of the prophecy. John 19, let's turn to John's Gospel, chapter 19. John 19, verse 32. <coughs> here we have the story then came the soldiers verse 32 of John 19 and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him now they break the legs of those two malefactors because you know in crucifixion you don't die that quickly it was a bit of a messy business being crucified and you don't die quite quickly and what they used to do, they'd go along and they'd smash with a chisel, they'd smash the kneecaps of uh, people who um, were crucified. That was one of the Romans, you know, they were civilized, they were meant to be. <laughs> First civilization, threw people to the lions and smashed their legs in. And they broke, used to break their legs like that. And um, the Catholics actually show crucifixes sometimes with... Christ's knees broken which is, shows just how blasphemous the whole lot of them are even the charismatic ones and um, says uh, but one uh, but when they came verse 33 to Jesus and saw that he was dead already they break knock his legs now I want to point out to you that Jesus didn't die Jesus committed his spirit to God the Father and gave up the ghost there was no way Jesus could die Jesus had to dismiss his spirit it was of his own will that he laid his life down no man took it from him crucifixion did not take the life of Christ he was laid in all order upon the altar and then he yielded up the spirit he dismissed his own spirit and that was why he did it before it came to the time that they should break the legs because he knew he had to dismiss his spirit to fulfill the prophecy so once he thirsted and once the terrible thirst had struck him and they offered him that drink and once he'd uh, committed his spirit to father he gave up because before the time came for the breaking of the legs so he fulfilled the prophecy perfectly to the letter he let everything be laid in all order upon the wood and the wood was the cross the gibbet that was the way he was to be crucified for was it not written cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree therefore he was made a curse for us that we might be made the righteousness of God do you remember the scripture in Colossians now that it had to be the cross had to be because that was what was prophesied in Isaiah so he went all the way now when they came along he gave up the ghost and he yielded up his spirit so they wouldn't break his legs but he also permitted his heart to be broken uh, and it says verse 34 one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water and he that saw it bear record and his record is true and he knoweth that, he's, um, that he saith is true that you might believe for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled a bone of him shall not be broken and again another scripture saith they shall look on him whom they pierce now there you are it's all down there in scripture Jesus perfectly fulfilled it but he did it voluntarily he did it of his own free will and at each stage he chose 
That is the incredible thing. He was in perfect control of the situation. Why, when the men came to arrest him, they came out, they didn't arrest him, he went with them. Didn't he? Looked at them, said it's I, and they fell back affrighted. Peter locked off someone's ear, so Jesus stuck it back. I mean, he, he, you know, <laughs> he was in total control. Pilate said, don't you know I've got power to do this and do that? Jesus said, you haven't got any power except what's given you from above. Who do you think you are? Didn't quite put it that way. It's the kind of tenor of what he was saying, really. Hmm? All done in order. And Jesus kept it in perfect order. He could have violated the scripture at any point, but because it was written in his heart, you remember we saw written in his heart, Therefore, in Psalm 40, we talked about written in the, the law written in the heart, therefore he knew exactly what he'd got to fulfill. So he did it. And we need to take note of the written word of God to know exactly what it says, and we've got to fulfill it. We've got to obey the scripture. Not one jot or tittle's passed from the law till all be fulfilled, and we better start realizing that if you want to dodge the word of God and what God says in his word you are dodging the cross oh you're saying but I'm saved I'm not arguing about that I'm saying you're dodging the cross that's a different story and we go on to um, uh, Matthew uh, let me see just a minute where am I Oh, we go to John 38 first. Uh, John, verse 38. John 19, 38, sorry. Verse 38 of 19. I was in 19, wasn't I? Ah, oh, well. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and bought a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Uh, now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre wherein never was man yet laid, there laid they Jesus. Therefore because of the Jews' preparation for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. Now I want to point out to you something that's interesting, if you're interested. One thing is that when you bury someone after the Jew Jews, they, they took uh, they took a hundred pound uh, mixture of myrrh and alloys. Now, when they put that on someone and they wrapped them round in grave, grave clothes, it became like plaster of Paris, absolutely solid. Did you know that? So you see, that was a miracle when Jesus rolled up the grave clothes, because it would have been like getting out of concrete. You've seen pictures of mummies, haven't you? How the bandage is all sweat, but they go like concrete. That was one of the things to preserve the body. See? And yet, oh, how Jesus he just stood up and wound it up and put it down. <laughs> just stepped out to heaven. That's his way. All miracles. And in Matthew 29... Matthew 29 go back there that's something I found out in Israel you find out lots of things in Israel um, Matthew 29 verse 8 it's 27 I beg your pardon dear oh dear I was getting worried there I haven't got a special Bible don't worry I beg your pardon it's Matthew 27 and verse 57 um, 
And it goes on and says, And when even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, whom also himself was Jesus' disciple. Now, once again, you get the story of him wrapping the body in clothes. But notice here, it mentions that he was a rich man. Therefore, he made his grave with the rich, which once again fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah. All right? So everything was done in order. In other words, exactly as the offering was to be flayed and laid in order and the wood was to be in order, Christ, in perfect order, fulfilled the prophetic utterances toward his death. And he engineered it in the sense that he allowed it to happen and he fulfilled it absolutely to the letter. Now the offering was flayed. Now by flaying, it means that you take off the skin and you reveal the innards. And when you flay something, um, you reveal its guts, if you want. And that is exactly what happened to Jesus throughout his life. He revealed exactly what was in his nature. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. They sm smote him, they struck him on the cheek, they spat upon him, they whipped and scourged him, and yet his nature was one of forgiveness. And any true Christian who has the Spirit of Christ and is walking God's way and God says, go that way, son, he will do the same. There's a story I think I've told you about of a um, great man of God called James Naylor, who's little known, who um, was mightily used in the Quaker revivals, and up and down the country, probably one of the greatest preachers England's ever known. No, he's the greatest preacher, I would say, England's ever known. Mighty man of God, moved by the Holy Ghost. And the ranters who, who were around at that time plotted against him and they um, hid a letter on his person which he didn't know about which, um, where he was named as Jesus Christ and then they accused him to the magistrates of, of declaring himself to be Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And um, they took him and they whipped him and they made him ride naked through Bristol on a horse, you know, sitting backwards, ride naked. And then they took him up into this tower and they bore his tongue through with a red hot poker before they put him in prison. They just bore his tongue through. And it's recorded that after he, the man who was doing it just wept, he was an executioner, a man with a mask on it, he just wept. He couldn't bear to do it because he knew this man was a good man. And he just wept and wept. And James Naylor, when he stood up, said he reached over and kissed the man on the cheek. I mean, that's the spirit of Christ. Hmm? Now, I'm not suggesting any of you are about to have your tongue bored through and <laughs> must perform so. You see, God will give you that mountain if you graduate. Some of you don't look as though you want to graduate. <laughs> okay, the other thing they did, you remember in Leviticus, they washed the inward parts. You remember they had to wash the inwards and the legs, and they were washed with water. Now the inward side of a sacrifice and the inward parts speak of the motives and the impulses and the inspirations of life. That's what they depict, the inwards. And the legs speak of the walk and manner of life. And water speaks of what? The Word of God, that's right, the written Word. And so, you see, Jesus' walk was according to the Word, and his inward impulses and desires were according to the Word. And if you turn with me to Psalm 51, Psalm 51, verse 6. Psalm 51, verse 6. Behold. Have you got that? Psalm 51, verse 6. 
got it. Verse. Um, this is a psalm of David. And you'll remember when Nathan the prophet came to him after he'd gone into Bathsheba. You remember that? And um, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. And we come down to um, behold, verse 5, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Now hyssop was used for blood, and there was the sprinkling of the water. You remember? Now God desires truth in the inward parts. And... Um, we need truth in our insides. It's easy to be outwardly a Christian. It's having the inward disposition of Christ. It's having the willingness to yield to Father's word no matter what it costs me. And if there's no cost, believe me, there is no crown. No cross, no crown. No cost, no reality. If a man won't give up everything Jesus said and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. It doesn't say he can't be saved. Cannot be my disciple. And we're talking about discipleship. And we want to be the disciples or the followers of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, don't we? We want to be the ones that are taught of him. Disciple is someone who learns, taught of God. And we want to walk according to his word. And we need that truth in our inward parts. We need to meditate on his word day and night, don't we? And we must fulfill every scripture. We dare not violate it in one degree. If we do, we violate the cross. We dodge the thing. The cross is the power of God into salvation, wrote Paul. And if I dodge the word of God and won't fulfill it and live it and be it, I violate salvation. I lose the very power that would bring me into true salvation. I sh shirk the way. And Jeremiah, um, chapter 31 Jeremiah 31 and it says in verse 33 oh let's take um Verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. And I want you to note that God chose to be a husband and have a bride in the Old Testament according to scripture and I didn't write it but I do believe it um, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days saith the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, 
from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now I want to point out that God says all shall know me from the least to the greatest but you can only know him as the truth is in your inward parts. There are a lot of people that claim to know Christ and they claim this promise but I always look to find out whether they're fulfilling the word of God in their lives. You see, the mark of it is truth in the inward parts first. isn't it? That's what it says. That's what's got to be. Got to have the truth in my inward part. And um, John 8. Don't mind going through the scriptures because it's the written word and you've got to fulfill it. And John 8 verse 29 Jesus said this Jesus said, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Now, if you've got the truth in your inward parts, there'll be one disposition that'll be vital in you. You'll only do the things that please Father. You won't be pleasing yourself or taking your own decisions or deciding what's right and wrong. It's not yours to decide. It's Father's. And there's only one way you'll know, and it's not by what I say, it's by what the book says. And there's only one touchstone, and that's the written word. And it's not parts of the written word taken out for convenience. For instance, people talk about the love of Jesus Christ. And they go on and on about love. One third of the New Testament speaks about hell. Providing you balance your preaching one third with hell and judgment, then do speak two thirds about love. Well, they don't seem to like that. Oh, but it's all grace. <laughs> well, I want to tell you it isn't all grace. Or should I say it is all grace? But grace can't be separated from truth in Christ. He came full of grace and truth. And unfortunately he wants truth in your inward part. And if you want to be a partaker of grace, your inward part's got to have truth in it. Isn't that wonderful? Hmm? Glory to God, we've got a God who's righteous. Demand truth in my inward part right disposition and attitude absolutely willing to do will of father and only do those things that please him when you get up in the morning can you say well I'm going to live today pleasing father it says in his words I must do this I'll do it well father I would do it but my husband isn't the type of man he should be so I won't that's not pleasing father that's rebellion and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Well, Father, I'd like to love my wife, but she is a cow. Fancy doing that. She burnt my toast. And she put butter over it. Thought I wouldn't notice. I don't know. I mean, I'm him stupid things, but... You know what I mean? It's disposition of art. When you go to work, it says honour your boss. You've got to work honestly. Love your children. Reverence dignitaries. It's including traffic wardens who give you a ticket. Um, you've got to you've got to have a an authority set by God. You say, but they're not. They're appointed by the GLC. They might be, but... And it's a stupid law, isn't it? If you're like Klaus, you have a disabled badge in your back and you let me get the ticket. And, but, you know, the thing is, they're ordained, all authorities ordained of God. 
only taking simple wicked illustrations to show you and then let's go on that's that's the inward part and then the walk and if you turn to psalm 119 beautiful psalm that we'll read it shall we maybe not one day and verse 11 Or let, let me take, um, uh, let's take verse 9. Now, every one of you that has a Bible, if you will only obey this, God will transform your life. If you want to be truly baptized in the Holy Ghost, not get a thrill up your spine and think that's it, or say banana backwards and think you've got something, do this and you'll have a real experience. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way or a young woman or an older woman or an older man but you see born again you'll be young won't you by taking heed according to thy word first thing with my whole heart have I sought thee oh let me not wander from thy commandments thy word have I hidden in mine heart that I might not sin against thee Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Look at this for a psalm. This is a new covenant. People said David wasn't born again. Well, didn't look at this. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word, with my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. In other words, the thing that David abhorred was sin. And he said, how can I cleanse my way? By taking heed to your, your commandments. It's the written word of God. I've got to imbibe it and I've got to obey it and I've got to live it. And when Jesus was on the cross on Calvary, what he was speaking to everyone was, listen, I'm hanging here because Father said so. I allow myself to thirst like this and cry out I thirst because Father wrote it in the book. In the volume of the book it's written to me. I come to do thy will, O God. I allow men to smite my back because Father said to it. In other words, the whole thing was obedience. He went to the cross out of pure obedience to father it was pleasing father it was what father said he wanted have you ever realized that it was pure obedience every one of the commands of God Jesus fulfilled in his life that is what we are called to do isn't that wonderful hmm? it's simple all you have to do is read the book and obey it now, could anything be more simple? Now, it means you don't deviate from it. I spoke to a vegetarian this morning. No, oh, I'll never change. No, she won't. She'll go to hell. That's her choice. Now, it says in the Bible that if a man abstains from meat, it's a doctrine of death. You always manage to spread out in a longer line. Don't like you having such a wide berth. <laughs> um. We're going to go on with um, the, burn, uh, the, the five offerings. Now, you remember, in the tabernacle, as we said on Tuesday, um, in the tabernacle, there were to be offered five offerings. No point in having a tabernacle unless you have a purpose for it, and God's purpose was that there might be offerings made. And four of the offerings were with blood, and one was without blood. You all remember that. Hmm? Right, which was the bloodless one? The meat offering. It's very good. And now we're going on to deal with a burnt offering. 
Now the burnt offering is a very specific offering in one regard that nothing comes back to the offerer. It's all burnt. In other words, it's a total giveaway. You remember with the um, meat offering, what happened? You don't remember. Hmm? The priests had it. They, all the frankincense was burnt, as you remember. And uh, the priests had a fine flour mixed with what? Hmm? Oil? Yeah. And honey? No. That's right. Weren't allowed. God forbade honey, which speaks of natural sweetness. Uh, that's one thing God doesn't accept in any sacrifice. Uh, the natural human attributes. Many people a mistake for holiness, a personality that's developed in culture or is ever such a gracious person. That's natural sweetness and God has forbidden it in his kingdom. That's why you don't find many people like that get very far with God, though they'll get very far in the world's church. And there's a lot of them around. Okay, so we go on to the burnt offering, and if you turn with me to the good book and Leviticus chapter 1, it's the third book of Moses, so they tell us. And in verse 1, the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntarily, voluntary will, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation of the Lord. Now, what is so similar to the meat offering? Hmm? Voluntary. This was not a compulsory thing. He had to voluntary do it. Uh, it's nothing to do with sin. In this sense, it's not a sin or a trespass offering, nor is it a peace offering. It's a burnt offering. And you remember that these four things depict, um, the four, four ones with blood, depict the act upon the cross. And this one portrays uh, the side of the Lord offering himself willingly upon the cross. And it's important that we see that he did it of his own will. He volunteered to do it and did it. In eternal heavens, when God said what was going to happen and God talked with God, Father said to Son, You know, Son, you'll create them, but there's going to be sin. And Son said, I know, Father. And Father said, Well, what should we do? And Son said, Well, Father, I'll become man and lay down my life that I might win them by my love and father said that's fine son and so it was so it was worked out before the creation of the world in God's heart and Jesus the word became flesh and I want to trace it through this glorious truth of the burnt offering now Jesus never ever gave his life because he sinned. He was the sinless one, the holy one. There was no reason for him to lay down his life. He voluntarily did it, didn't he? He did it of his own free will. And yet, within the pages of the good book, we learn something about the nature of his will. And it is this sacrifice above all else that really shows forth the love of Christ. And um, 
if you go on from verse uh, 3, notice verse 3, it did say that it had to be a male without blemish. And there was only one male ever that lived without blemish. The Christ of God. He was the only one who walked a holy, pure, sinless life. Thank God for that. And um, verse 4, And he shall put his hand upon the um, upon the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him alright let's go on to um, um, we'll read on yeah and verse 5 and he shall kill the bullet before the Lord and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire and the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar but his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice an offering made by fire of a sweet savour unto the Lord I, w I just want to stop there because we want to go through and pick out exactly what everything means now um we're going to do a Bible study, so we're going to turn the pages of the book and we're going to look. Because everything really is explained if one goes through Scripture. And one needs to go through Scripture and not get anyone else's ideas. Don't you agree? Because in the end, it's only the good book that will tell us. And you'll remember that, first of all, the offering had to be without blemish. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9 Hebrews chapter 9 Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. That word spot there in the Greek, as you all know, means without fault or without blemish. Jesus Christ offered himself and he was the one without blemish. The only one that's ever been without blemish. He offered himself unto God. And he offered himself totally voluntarily. Now I want to explain something that, um, if you look up for a minute, uh, we'll go back looking down in a second. There is something very important to understand, that only God is good. Do you remember Nicodemus came to Jesus by night? He was a man who came and he said, good master, and he says, there's none good, said Jesus, save God. Hmm? and he says we know no, no man can do these miracles except he come from God and Jesus didn't take the compliment because he didn't like honey uh, he knew that was a sacrifice that had to be refused by God you know God never likes being complimented in that way uh, he is because of his majesty his might and his glory all things and he's so wonderful but he doesn't like us to come and to try and uh, win things out of him by telling him how wonderful he is in the wrong way. You know, he doesn't like flattery. He likes truth from the inward part. Many men flatter God. They seek to say such wonderful things. They think God will think they're wonderful back. But it must come from an inward reality. If I don't know it deep within my soul, it's the same as singing. Uh, when I sing something unto God in a meeting, 
then I must sing it from my inward part. Now tonight, when a lot of you came in, you didn't sing from your inward parts. You sang. But you didn't sing from your inward parts. Now God totally disregarded it. That's that. He wasn't having anything to do with it, so we sat down. And that's that. Now, that's why a meeting will lift sometimes and God moves and it won't lift at other times because people aren't singing from their inward parts. You didn't. Lots of you didn't. I could look round the room and say, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't. You didn't. It's quite simple. When you're in touch with the Lord, you know who's moving in reality and who isn't. Now, you see, the truth must come from the inside why when Nicodemus came and said good master we know Jesus looked at him and said there's none good save God what he was actually saying to Nicodemus is don't you really know who I am Nicodemus had a suspicion but wasn't prepared to confess it he was a Pharisee but um, praise God is meant to mention later on in the scriptures and I believe that God, in the end, brought him to a real experience. But the thing was that he came and said, Good Master, now there's no one good save God. There is no one who's righteous or has righteousness but Christ and God. There's only one person who could live a righteous and holy life. That was God. Now God wanted to atone for man and restore man into communion with him. Now there was no way that man could atone for man because man was conceived and born in sin. Sin had entered the human race and by it genetically sin is passed down. You might be one of these people that believe that everyone is born um, holy, they're not. They're born with a seed of Satan and the seed of sin within themselves. It is within their nature, it is intrinsic within their being. There is no man who is born under the sun save the one and only Jesus Christ who was ever born without sin. He was born of the Holy Ghost, conceived of the Virgin Mary, and there was no male seed passed into him. The seed was God's seed and Mary's seed. You see, because Adam sinned, Eve didn't. Eve was deceived. Adam made the willful choice. This is why God makes a great distinction between man and woman when it comes to dealing in the church. A wife must submit to her husband in all things. Why? Because a woman is susceptible to deception in the spirituals. Very open to deception. That's the way she's made. You'll notice that a woman will usually move by intuition. A man will move in his plodding way by logic. A woman will enter far easier into the things of God. But my, won't she step far quicker out of them. Move out of that ordering God and you're on a death trap. Believe me. That's why when I go to many, many churches where I see the women wear the trousers, I shudder. Because that's bound to end in deception. Bound to. Because God has said so. That's why he said, suffer a woman not to teach nor to usurp authority. All right? Now that seed of woman, though, uh, Eve didn't sin. Adam sinned. You see, God had spoken to Adam. You remember the story? Hmm? God said to Adam, now Eve, now Eve heard what God had said to Adam. But she wasn't spoken to direct. And therefore when Paul recounts it, he says Eve was deceived. Adam sinned. He made a decision and sinned. You understand that? Now when Christ was conceived, he was conceived of this seed of woman. But it was God's seed who joined with the seed of woman and therefore that holy thing that was born was a sinless son son of God and son of man you understand the two had to come together and that is why it's vital 
And we must understand that the virgin birth, if it wasn't a virgin birth, then forget it, Pastor, there is no salvation because Christ couldn't have been sinless. You understand that? That is why uh, you'll get in the attacks of the, um, uh, whatever they are called, I can't think of the name, it's gone from my mind. Um, um, the idiots who call themselves theologians in the present day, modernists, will always attack the, the virgin birth and they'll, you know, you find people when they want to attack, oh, you know, I don't believe in the virgin birth, but that is absolutely primarily essential to faith in God. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, you cannot be a Christian. Impossible. Because you can't believe in, if you don't believe in the virgin birth, you can't believe in the Holy Son of God. And that's fact. Because, you see, he'd have been born in sin and conceived in sin, wouldn't he? Hmm? It's the same way that lots of people come to me. I had a vicar. He, I came and saw me, and um, I was talking with him, and he said, well, he, he said, of course, the Old Testament's mythology, you know, it's good Anglican. So the Old Testament's mythology, like, uh, well, like any story, it's just illustrations. And I said, sir, might I stop you there and ask you one question? And he said, all right. So I said, well, if sin came in by more than one man, it would have taken more than one man to atone for it. If it wasn't just Adam that sinned, if there'd been many, many, then there would have had to be many, many sacrifices. But because Adam sinned and sin came in by one man, therefore in the righteousness of God and in his righteous judgment, one man could atone for that. Now God in his wisdom allowed Satan to get at the one man. He knew about procreation. God knew that there was going to be multitudes and nations upon the earth but he made sure that the serpent moved against Adam and Eve while there was only one. That was the wisdom of God. Now the serpent in his mind thought if I can get the original one if I can get the one before there's a multitude upon the earth then he thought I'll have the whole earth under my power. Such was Satan's reasoning. Now God knew Satan's pride so he knew that that would be his thought. Get the top man. The others will just be born that way. And Satan thought he could usurp God's authority on the earth. But what Satan didn't bargain with was that when he caused man to rebel against God, what was born and conceived in the heart of Adam was rebellion. So every single person that was born after that had a rebel heart. Now, not only would they rebel against God, but they rebelled against Satan also. I mean, that was in their nature. They couldn't yield to God, and they weren't going to yield to the devil either. So then he had to work out schemes of how he'd get them to worship him. But you see, God had seen all this beforehand. Praise his wonderful name. He knows all things from the beginning to the end. So he organized it that way. Left Adam in the garden. I mean, God didn't go to sleep when the serpent came to tempt Adam. He wasn't asleep. That was in his plan. He knew it would happen. But he knew it had to happen with the one man before the others came. Isn't that wonderful? Cared that much for us, he made sure it happened with the one. And he allowed it to happen. I mean, he could have smote the devil dead then and there. He had the power, didn't he? Could have finished the thing like that, but no. He let it go on. That's the, the miracle of it all. That's why I think it's so wonderful when I start to 
to go into the story of salvation and of God to think that God knew and in his grace and his love he made jolly sure that Adam sinned before there was any other seed upon the earth now he allowed the seed to become contaminated when it was just one seed in Adam all die in Christ all are made alive you see one man and that was why it was so essential now of course if you don't believe in Adam and Eve you can't be a Christian can you and that's that I mean it's just impossible to be a Christian if you don't believe in Adam and Eve because a Christ man or a Christian believes in atonement for sin and if it didn't come by one man that's Paul's argument when he writes the letter to the Romans chapter 5 and 6 you remember uh, chapter 4 and 5 I beg your pardon where he talks about it sin came in by one in Adam all sin hmm? you understand that in the same way don't forget he argues or or the writer to the Hebrews argues should I say that uh, uh, Levi paid tithes while he was in the bowels of Abraham do you remember that when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek and he argued that Levi paid tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek even though he was not yet born you remember that story now he might have been generation further down but he was still counted to have paid tithes even though he hadn't been born so a lot of things that you find God gives you credit for in your life could be two generations back and a lot of sin that has to be dealt with in you was conceived two or three generations back and sometimes more to the third and fourth generation the judgment of God and these things work in the spirituals and that is the way it is and I want to go on our original father therefore sin and Jesus the only holy one and it had to be a holy one as Adam sinned Adam was created holy Adam was created innocent now when I say innocent it meant that he was without temptation at that point he was in innocence he did not know the difference between good and evil the only command he had from God was you can do what you like, you can eat anywhere, tend the garden, but don't touch the tree in the middle of the garden. And what tree was that? Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now don't touch that tree. Take of the tree of life if you want to, but not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now Adam wanted freedom of choice. So he took of that tree so he could decide what was right and what was wrong. And that is man's fault today. I tell you this, that many, many people, if you want to analyze where they go wrong with God, it's they want to decide what they'll accept and what they won't accept. I find many people, when you turn them to the scriptural page and the good book, they won't accept what the good book says. They'll accept it up to the point that it suits them, but when it touches self in them, then they don't like it. I remember I was asked to see a, a woman who um, was violent disagreement with her husband, and I touched on the scripture, wives, submit yourselves. Well, I don't believe in that. She was a women's, whatever they are, Liberace or something. And... She, she didn't believe in it, you see. So I said, now look, the book says in all things. It doesn't give conditions, that's what it says. Ah, oh, well, if he changes then... No, I said, dear, says that. says, well, I don't accept it. I said, well, that's what the book says. So she went away, and she's still in darkness, because she's determined not to accept it. Now you have to accept what God says, you see. We haven't a choice of deciding the nature of good and evil. 
We can't say this is good and that's bad. That is the sin of Adam. He wanted to decide what he wanted as good and what he wanted as evil. Do you understand? Now, God forbade that, and yet we as Christians, so often we like to draw a line and decide what we'll accept of God and what we won't. Now, if that's your touchstone, or if that's the thing you move on, you're yet in your darkness. You haven't ever had your rebel heart dealt with. You see, there is unequivocally no appeal against God's word. God's word is ultimate, God's word is final, and God's word is eternal, and God's word is going to judge you in the day of judgment. It will be God's word. You'll go up there and say, well, my husband wasn't kind to me, it is written. Say, so, well, I didn't accept that, it's written. And the word will judge you. Says so the word's going to judge you. You know, you can read the word and you can obey it, or you can read the word and you can choose to go your own way. Hmm? Got your choice? Said to another man, he came to see me, um, had a ministry, church, so-called, and he was living off, off what, what he didn't get. Well, in fact, he was not living, he was dying by faith. And I pointed out to him there were principles that he was violating in Scripture. Well, I'll give you another example. Three pastors came to me, and, and they were living on fizz. Now, fizz, in case you don't know, is family income supplement. They were living by faith, running churches, collecting fizz. Now, the reason they were collecting fizz is because the church couldn't pay them a high enough income because they were building new buildings. So they were going down and collecting off social security fears. So I said to the three of them, God will not bless your ministry. Well, why won't God? Because God's not supporting you. Oh, yes, he is. No, he isn't, because God doesn't pay for you through social security. He happens to have a glorious bank in heaven, and when he wants to call people out to his service, he doesn't use fizz to do it with. Oh, well, well. Two-thirds of the AOG ministers draw it, so why shouldn't we? Well, it happens to violate God's word. God says that a laborer is worthy of his hire. Hire? Well, well, we believe it. Anyway, you're allowed to do it. In the law of the country, I said, because the law allows for layabouts, it doesn't mean you can become one. I mean, the law now allows divorce. No Christian minister would recommend it, would they? Except in certain circumstances where the scripture recommends it. No one would do that. And the law allows homosexuality, but no Christian would even have any truck with it, would they? So I said, nor can you draw fears. Hmm. Well, two of them went away and won't speak to me since and say wonderful things about me. Um, they were one of an army, so praise God. But one took it to heart and he went back to his church and he said, right, he said, I will not draw family income supplement. That's it. If my wife and I starve, we starve. Now, what a heart. But I was called by God, I believe I have a real calling from God, and therefore God's going to keep me. And so he cancelled it, and for three months he nearly starved. Fourth month, the income of his church went up 40%, just like that. No reason. From then on, his church began to grow, and people began to be added. You know why? God decided that he was now trusting in God instead of in social security, so God thought it was safe to bless the man a little. That's the way God operates. Now, you see, it was according to the book. Now, two chose not to go according to the book, and their churches are getting smaller. In fact, one had to leave his church and has gone to another church, which he'll no doubt decimate as well. But the other pastor, his church is collapsing round him. Because he's violating biblical principle. Now, when you come to the Bible, there is no right of appeal. 
You cannot say, well, it's not what I want to accept. It's there, it's written, and it is eternal. And there is no variation. God in whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. And God will not change his mind for you. He hasn't put a special clause in saying, excluding David Green, who has a nice smile, so I won't make him do that. I mean, you've had it. You've got to do everything. And he won't say excluding Colin Clemenson because he can kick a bag of wind. I mean, he, he's not... He'll go and everyone it applies to. You see? And that's why the sword is a two-edged sword because when you preach the word, it cuts both ways. doesn't it? You see, I have to preach it from my heart, but if it hadn't cut my heart first, then it's not going to do much in you. If it upsets you, I want to tell you something, it upset me far harder and far deeper, far longer ago than you think. You see, there's many of you, but I got the whole lot of me. You see, a two-edged sword, whoom, but I had to take the lot my way. You think I'm kidding, I'm not. That's why when people get angry, I laugh. They don't know I got far more angry when I had it under me. <laughs> and therefore, they don't know. Well, I was born and conceived in sin like you. I did have a mother, irrespective of rumors. And I was born the same way. And, and you know, I had a father. And we're all born that way. And our natures are all the same. Now, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's something you confess freely. If you really have had God deal with your nature, you know, your sin nature, then you're prepared to open up and admit it. A fool buries his head in the sand. I think there's nothing more you know, stupid. Have you ever been to the zoo and looked at ostriches with their head buried? I mean, they look totally and utterly ridiculous with their backside stuck up in the air, two spindly legs and this neck with a, just disappearing into the ground. Now, they believe that they are safe and no one can see them. That's, what, that's why they do it for protection. Now, I, I mean, you don't have to be a great, great man of discernment to know that you could go up to that ostrich and give it one hefty boot in the backside and it would wake up realizing that someone could see him when it had their head stuck in the ground. Um, although an ostrich might boot you back and believe me, they have quite a kick, I'm told. Um, the thing is that Christians are a bit like that. They try and pretend that their heart isn't what it is. But the ridiculous thing is, it's so obvious to everyone else, the only person they deceive is themselves. Hypocrites only deceive themselves. Jesus sat there, you remember the story of Jesus sitting by the treasury, watching what people, how people put money in. He wasn't watching the amount, he was watching how they did it. And there was the widow's mite, you remember the story, and he watched the Pharisees throwing in out of their abundance. You see, it was how they did it. And he was watching. And Jesus watches us, you see. Now he knows what's going on inside and it's written all over your face and it's on your forehead and it's round you and it's in your disposition of body and spirit. It's obvious. When we move into praise, you can see light and darkness. You can see where it is. If you stand near people, you can feel the deadness of spirit. You can feel a dead spirit. I'm not suggesting you go around testing it. Um, but you can, you just know. If you know. And them that knows, knows. Um, that's why he's given us again. You see, th we should witness in our spirits one to another. And you know whether a spirit's alive or dead. Simple. Don't need a great gift of discernment. You know, saying, oh, and you discern, you need a discerned spirit, you just need to discern whether a man has life or death, that's all. 
You know, people think it's this discerning of devils. They're always trying to chase devils up the chimney. Silly people. I mean, they're not the trouble. The trouble's sin in people's lives. Can't blame the devil. People incriminate the devil. Accuse him of all sorts of things. And when they get to glory, God will say, now these are the works of the flesh, fornication, adultery, lasciviousness, all the things that they say, oh, it's a spirit of lust, or it's a spirit of this, or it's a spirit of... God will say, no, it's not, it's a sin of the flesh. It's written. Say, well, I didn't believe it. No, you might not, but it's down in the book. And that's what will judge you. And so, God had to come in Christ. God. And how he was the only one that could live a holy and pure life incarnate. God. Jesus said there's none good save God. What he was saying to Nicodemus is, Nicodemus, I'm God. Nicodemus didn't want to hear that. And wouldn't accept it. He came down and he came in visible form to earth as the son of God if you turn with me to Psalm 40 can someone open the door back there so we can get some air anything to get a little air in even I'm hot so it must be hot and Psalm 40 Jesus came in the visible form of God, but in Psalm 40 we read, um, in, uh, let's take verse 7. Then said I, um, oh, um, let's take verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offering hast thou not required then said I lo I come in the volume of the book it is written of me I delight to do thy will O my God yea thy law is within my heart and if you have a Cambridge Bible it will have in the margin in the midst of my bowels I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continuous, continually preserve me. Um, it's talking of Christ here and it's prophetic. And he says, verse 7, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it's written of me, I delight to do thy will, O God. Now Jesus' delight was to do God's will. It was voluntary. That was his delight, to do God's will. The second thing was, Yea, thy law is within my heart. Now there were two things about Christ when he came in visible form. First he came with the sole intention of doing God's will and that was the only delight he got in life. That was the delight to do God's will and Father's will. The second thing was his law, that's God's law, was in his heart. There was no way that Christ was going to deviate from God's law. It was in him, and he was going to fulfill it. Come what may, he was going to be God on earth, walking among men. That was his determination. And if you turn with me then to John 10... And John 10, and we take verse 15...
and it says these words as the father knoweth me even so know I the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have which are not of this fold them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold one shepherd therefore doth the father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again no man taketh it from me but I lay it down of myself Jesus Christ laid down his life of himself when Pilate turned around and said don't you know I've got power to let you go and I've got power to kill you Jesus said you can't have any power except it's given you from above you can't do it when Mary went to call Jesus and said uh, you know they have no wine Jesus turned around and said woman my hour has not yet come speaking prophetically of his death which was three, three years hence but he was so in touch with father he knew what father's will was and he knew his hour hadn't come you understand when the disciples got fearful and said look let, oh you know one of them who was it um, Thomas said oh come on let's go up to Jerusalem and die with him and uh, I mean he got faithless but Jesus knew exactly where he was going and what was going to happen he went through with God he knew and we have to come to a place of realizing that when Christ came and when the burnt offering which is depicted of Christ was laid upon the altar it was a perfect fulfillment of Father's will now it's noticeable if you just look back into Leviticus we're going to go through it to show how it symbolized the cross but in Leviticus 1 you might have noticed something that was um, or you might not have noticed Uh, verse 6 and he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces Leviticus 1 and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire now firstly the wood had to be in order and the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts the head the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar and you'll notice that it keeps coming up in order in order now there was a definite order and why was there a definite order why is it put there by the Holy Ghost I mean did that mean they mustn't put it there hickledy pickledy no God wanted it laid there in order you remember when Abraham flayed the animals do you remember in the furnace smoking furnace passed between them do you remember he was told to do how to divide the animals God had an order and God has an order and if you go on uh, looking in the, into Christ's life you'll, life, you'll see everything was laid out in order. Everything. Every detail in his life had a prophetic order. It was prophesied before time and he fulfilled the law and the prophets. It was all done in the perfect order both of the sacrifice being laid on the wood, the wood being laid in the order, and the prophetic utterances all coming to pass through his life in order. And we're just going to examine them. Christ was laid in order upon Calvary. Everything was done in perfect order. And we're going to go through them, and if you've got a pen, mark it down. If you'd start in Psalm 22, verse, verse 18... Psalm 22 all right Psalm 22 we've got verse 18 and it says these words they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture did they or didn't they yes they did go back to verse 8 
He trusteth on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him delivering, deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. All right? Did that happen or didn't it? Peter T-Bone steak. Fancy going to glory to a banquet in heaven. And you find it steaks all over the table. <laughs> oh, I'm a vegetarian, you'll say. <laughs> Ah, you say, I never touch alcohol. Oh, my cup's full and running over. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not suggesting that you eat excess or you drink to excess, but I'm saying in heaven you'll have a glorified body. And who knows what it can take? <laughs> ah. And you won't put on weight either. Glory to God. Well, it says we're going to a banqueting hall, doesn't it? What are you doing at a banqueting hall? Eat! Glory, Shane will be happy there. <laughs> she won't have to do the cooking. <laughs> yeah, you call it, you know, it's a place of joy. Uh, Psalm 40, verse 8. It's good to laugh. Laughter's medicine for the soul. Hmm? And Psalm 40, verse 8. Going right back to it. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart, or in the midst of my bowels. Jesus Christ when he was put upon the cross his bowels had been washed with pure water his legs or the walk of his life had been washed in water he was nailed the wood was put in order he was flayed his inner being was revealed everything was exposed to man and to the world and he fulfilled perfectly the word of father hmm? and do you know he did that that we might see that there was a way to walk in life where we could fulfill father's word we can become that in Christ that he desires would you like to have a testimony of you when you get to heaven father says my son in whom I'm well pleased and you look round and he says no don't look round son it's you I'm talking about me father yes yeah, son you always did those things that pleased me that was your heart you walked according to my word that is what Christ is looking for that's the bride he's coming for no other bride but the one that does those things that are well pleasing in his sight no cross no crown if you won't take the word of God and allow it to cut into you and allow it to deal with your rebellion and with your self nature and crucify it out of you you won't be a true partaker of the heavenly kingdom that I promise you there is no right of appeal every word of God has to be obeyed and has to be kept and it must become a part of your inward being every word that is how Christ went to the cross he fulfilled scripture and he hung there in obedience to Father he even dismissed his spirit at the right time even in the agony and the sweat and the terrible trial he knew exactly when to dismiss his spirit. That's how much in control he was. He did exactly what pleased Father. Would you do that? Or are you hiding under your fig leaves with your self-nature and your sin? very much prevalent don't worry your fig leaves hide nothing 
except your own vanity? If you don't let God come and deal with you, you'll never enter in. There's a way into God, but it's got to be by the cross. That word's got to go down into your heart, and you've got to be a willing, willing, voluntary, a bear of that word. You've got to do it with a free and happy will. That is the burnt offering, the part of the sacrifice of Christ that was the free will offering is that the part you're willing to give to him hmm laying down your life like that would you be prepared to do that for Jesus do you remember we used to sing that old chorus I'd like to sing it again you play I delight to do thy will O Lord you know tonight I've shared with you what Jesus did you know his love for you are you prepared to move toward him and open your heart for him to move in you or are you still living with your self righteousness and your rebellion we're going to sing it Can you sing it as a truth or can you make it a prayer? If you can't sing it because it's so, will you pray it? Oh God, I want it to be so. I want to be like Jesus who's willing to fulfill your word. I want my inward parts washed by the water of your word till it's true within me that every part of your word I'm willing to obey. I'm willing to yield. I want to be what you want me to be, O oh God. Could that be your prayer tonight? Lord, there's so many things in your word that we don't fulfill. So many mountains that need climbing. So many victories that need winning. So many things, O oh God, that we desire to have done. Oh God, make it true. Make it true in every heart. Would you sing it to God? If you can't sing it in truth from your inward part, sing it as a prayer to Him. Oh God, that's what I want. I want to delight to do your will. I want to delight to do your will. Those things that are pleasing in your sight. I delight to do thy will, O Lord. I delight to do Yes, I'm prepared to be the embodiment of what he desires. I'm prepared only to do what pleases Father. I'm prepared to let the cost come into my life. I want the cross. I want to embrace the cross. I want to despise the shame. 
I want to do what God desires. I don't want to have any excuses. I don't want to compromise my life. I want to go God's way 100%. If anything's shady or doesn't seem quite right, then I'll fly from it. I'll go 10 miles extra just to go God's way. I'd rather do excessively more than God desires than just to scrape through. I'd reach down to the furthest mile, oh God. I want to do your will. Oh Lord, I want it to be a delight. I want to delight your heart, oh Father. I want to be pleasing to you. When I look at what Jesus has done for me, oh Father, then how can I do anything but yield myself to you and desire only to do your will? Oh God, oh God, touch every heart. You want truth in the inward parts, oh God. You don't want to share. You don't want something that's not real. You want something real within. There's so many, oh God, that don't know truth in the very inward path. Don't desire, do you will. They find it grievous. But oh God, it should be a joy to please you. A delight to have the cost. Lord, work it into our lives. Have mercy on us. Make that new covenant with us. Write your law in our hearts. Write your truth in our inward parts, O oh God. Let the water of your word cleanse us with it. Let our inward being be cleansed. Cleanse our legs, our walk. O oh Jesus, Jesus. Make it a prayer of sincerity, O oh Lord, from each heart, from each life, from each being. I delight, I want to delight to do your will.
good and perfect will. Amen. To thee. Amen. To Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And remember, the water of the wedding feast turn into wine for life as they did it. Amen. Well, time's slowly crept by.